Well, thanks, and, and good morning. Um, thanks for having me up here. It's not too far for me to drive, and I was commenting on how I brought, brought a little Seattle weather, or maybe this is normal. Um, we had a good good day yesterday uh, at all the residents. We uh, had a nice interactive session on well, I consider one of the corollaries to to what we're going to talk about today. After surveillance, we talked about practice cancer prevention, and kind of went through some of those mechanisms. And I, I don't know that I scared them away because they're all sitting in the back now. <laughs> 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 okay, fine. They're uh, while they be oh, is that right? Yeah, right. We make ours sit in the front row. So, no, but uh, I'll. Um, no ideas. No, no, that's okay. Um, so I want to spend about the next 40, 45 minutes on active surveillance again. What I would like to do is paint a, paint a story first and get through the, the preliminary background because I think up here, uh, at least in Canada, my impression is that active surveillance is wholly more embraced than in the United States. And so I'll get through the background and the rationale of why uh, I think and why my perspective on active surveillance, which again is, is nothing uh, overly novel, but to get to the point that I can talk about our study that, that, that UBC takes part in, and uh, I described some of the outcomes and some of the directions that we're going in active surveillance because I think it's very important, hopefully, to the future uh, of this field. So what's been going on in active surveillance? Um, the, the state of the art, and this shows two conferences, that one was a little more than a year ago at the NCI, a state of the science conference, and then quickly followed up in, in Europe and uh, obviously showing that the times are right to try to understand active surveillance. And out of these two conferences, and I, I went to both of them and presented, many action items came out. And, and, and they came out with important questions they, that we, we all thought uh, would be interesting to address and vital to address in active surveillance. And they're listed here. And it provides actually a really nice forum on which to base uh, this talk, spending about five minutes on each section. And we'll kind of work through first starting out with regard to the patient population, how is active surveillance and, and other strategies defined, then get down to how patients do on a short and long-term basis, eventually get down to how we can, how, uh, what the factors are that, that offer and the acceptance of active surveillance, and then finally end with, with research, which is really what gets me excited um, and what we're taking part in as a, as a team. So again, going through the background very quickly, we, we know this, that prostate cancer has changed through the ages. There's been a great stage migration of disease now primarily due to PSA screening, and I won't really get into PSA screening We've beaten that horse uh, quite a bit. The number of diagnoses clearly outweighs uh, the number of lethal cases, so-called over over detection. And then, of course, many men are many men are treated uh, uh, even with low risk disease and that so-called over treatment. And um, just skip this for now. Uh, the, the the face of prostate cancer has changed, and I think this is again nothing new uh, to any of us. But when one looks at uh, the time when PSA screening first started, there on the left of the screen, you can see that a full uh, uh, one in four, and, and, and over half the patients presented with either advanced or uh, uh, high-risk disease. So either metastatic disease, one in four, and you see that that one in four has now gone all the way to one in 50, and maybe even less than that as far as uh, the face of prostate cancer stage, and this is wholly due to PSA screening. Um, I, I at, at first had a different slide, Dr. Goldenberg's uh, rabbits and, and the birds, but this is uh, one from Laura Esserman that was published in JAMA, and that she's a breast uh, surgeon that also uh, has been very uh, involved in screening for breast cancer. And this is perhaps the snail, uh, and cancer detection is the X there. And you can see that uh, uh, perhaps the, the snail cancers have no diagnoses. These are the ones that are that are basically autopsy cancers. And then there's the turtles uh, that that are detected, but would be destined never to crawl through this blue zone into the regional zone stays localized the entire time. And then these other ones that are more difficult to catch, particularly the so-called bird that might not be detectable at all until it's metastatic. And we know that there is this different natural history. And I talked to the residents quite a bit yesterday. I think it's, it's important to understand how to operate and how to handle the technical aspects of surgery. But what's most important is to understand the disease and the disease process. So we know how to look and we know how roughly to see what a bird is, what a turtle is, maybe based on Gleason grade and otherwise, but how do we treat them? This is from Matt Cooperberg from Capture Data, and one can see here that on uh, the x-axis, that zero through 10 is essentially risk of disease. They use something called the CAPRA score, which has not been wholly embraced, but the 10 being the highest risk disease and the zero and the ones being kind of the turtles, if you will, 
uh, of prostate cancer. And you can see there that the green is radical prostatectomy, um, even in the low-risk disease, and the, the, the brown here being what they call watchful waiting. And that's essentially some form of surveillance. And you can see clearly, and this is overall men, that even in the very low-risk turtles, the majority, overwhelming majority, get treated. Uh, of course, we can understand why they'd be treated up here, but in the low risk, do we need to treat? Are we over-treating? This is from Peter Albertson. Again, well-worn data. You can see here, this is contemporary uh, patients, not old patients, but contemporary series patients that were diagnosed within the PSA era. This is 10-year survival rates. And then when you look here at, a, at a, uh, the, the most common T1C, maybe a, a man in his 60s, over 10 years, there might be might be 40% that have died, but very, very, very few that are dying of prostate cancer. And this has been borne out in the literature of men that have been treated. So this is, if you look at this, this is over 10,000 men. And this is put together by Andrew Stevenson and others uh, and published recently in JCO. And when we looked at treated men with low-risk prostate cancer, 5,000 men, only 14 deaths uh, during the follow-up of this study, actuarial perhaps 2% death at 15 years, obviously. Some surgeons might say, these are all treated with surgery. This is, this is good treatment. But it begs the question whether they ever needed to be treated at all. Um, and so what's the level one data? What's the level one data that supports perhaps non-treatment or, or, or treatment? And there have been multiple trials. Again, many of these have been well cited, and you know these very well. This is the Scandinavian series, 700 men randomized to wash waiting or prostatectomy. Now, some of these men have PSAs up to 50. Uh, but many of them were well differentiated. They followed them for several years. There's been an update. I'm just showing the original paper. I'm cutting right to the chase, certainly on an overall mortality standpoint, uh, watchful waiting, 30% death uh, uh, overall, radical prostatectomy at a relative risk of 0.74. Significant difference between the two. Does this say treat everybody? And that was a sound bite that came out, and I think surgeons such as us, we like that. Here's the, here's the unadjusted KM or the, like the cumulative incidence of death, the treated population here, uh, and then untreated here, and there is the difference between the two curves. But was this really representative of what we see now today? And this again is where I, I harped a lot about this yesterday, understanding the patients and the natural history, this is not representative of what we see in the US and certainly not what you see in Canada. I think less representative. We might start getting back to this point, but 75% had palpable disease. We don't see that. It's more like 10%, 20% now. Uh, and very few were detected by PSA. And again, many of them had PSAs over 10. Very, very different from our population in the screening era. We might get back this way with uh, USPSTF, at least in the United States, with screening issues down there. We'll talk about that briefly. So what about a trial that really takes patients that are within the PSA era uh, the PIVOT trial, this is 700 patients. We uh, participated in this trial at, in, the, in the scale set, of course, because Mike Brower was one of the, the, the co-chairs of this trial. Again, so very similar, 700 patients. Very few of them have palpable disease. And cutting right to the chase, one looks here at overall, and this is what made the Wall Street Journal and the, and, and the New York Times, there was no difference between treatment and no treatment, uh, although uh, there might be some subgroups that benefited. So in the low risk, you see, there's, if anything, there's a trend. Uh, uh, it's definitely a trend with equality. And one looks here, this is the, the, the forest plot, again, on, on this, on that side. On the left side, the benefits prostatectomy. On the, the right side, benefits the observation. And when one looks at the low risk, you see that there's no doubt that it, it crosses the line of unity. Even if the, the, there was a cry that this was an underpowered trial, that's uh, given more patients because it originally was powered for more than double the number of patients. But one could see that perhaps if, even if it were more patients, whether this would really push that over to the benefit of prostatectomy, we, we, we doubt. Although when looked at intermediate and high risk, well, it does seem to be an actually an intermediate, a statistically significant benefit for prostatectomy. How many patients uh, were they mainly lower? Yeah, they were mainly low risk. So this was this, this trial was driven by low risk. It was uh, somewhere around 68, 70% uh, low risk, depending on how you, how you define it. Uh, but when one looks there, Again, a, another trial uh, begging this question whether we should watch these patients more. This is a little bit of my simpleton's uh, uh, analysis of this, but when this is the KM curve from the Scandinavian trial, I mean, clearly we see that these men despite, died despite treatment, uh, and these men might be the proportion, the proportion that benefited this axis 
will go all the way to 100. And so the natural history experiment here is these men probably could have avoided the diagnosis. These are guys 10 years out of, out of diagnosis. Nothing happened to them uh, regardless. And so these are the men that we need to, and again, that's the majority, that we need to concentrate our efforts in, in trying to figure out what to do. This has come out. This has been the, the result. The, the USPSTF, this is the, the Preventive Services Task Force, uh, put out this statement basically against prostate cancer screening based on some trials. And we won't get into any of the trials today because they've been studied extensively. I know that you all know about these trials. But the bottom line is the American trial did not show any difference in mortality with screening. The European trial did, although it was preventing one death per thousand screens. And you can see here 48 men additionally diagnosed. And then uh, uh, the, the statement listed in, in, in the USPSTF recommendation was lots of harms, lots of morbidity from screening. Let's stop it. And uh, uh, we've really actually overtreated too many patients, and this is what the what the statement said. So where do we go from now with that backdrop? Well, I want to present um, how we do active surveillance, perhaps not only uh, in our study that, that we take part in together, uh, but also uh, in in the other major studies. The major ones, one of the major ones being also uh, uh, north of north of our border in Toronto with with Lori Klotz's study. Hopkins has a, a large cohort, and others. And then what are the, what are the, generally, what are the long-term outcomes? And I think that's important as a backdrop to uh, supporting why we, why we do what we do. So I used to show this to all my patients uh, early on. I, I'd say, these are your options. Basically, uh, you know, where, where, what's the pros and cons? And I'd say, I'd draw the line at kind of the, the, the radiation, say curative options, non-curative options, what we're going to do. And there's this thing called watchful waiting, which has really undergone the change now. And I, I call this the paradigm change because we have all these semantical issues of watchful waiting and active surveillance. What, is, what does it mean? And this is a little cartoon that says, you know, I'm afraid you've had a paradigm shift. You know, something's changed in the night. Um, and it's been, a, again, in many places, it's been a long time, a paradigm shift. You look at what the differences are, and this is from Chris Parker from his paper, and I think it's a very apt description of the difference between active surveillance and watchful waiting, clearly active surveillance. The aim of active surveillance is to individualize the treatment. It's to uh, take a patient fit for radical treatment uh, that is low risk, whereas the watchful waiting is really an avoidance, an avoidance of treatment in perhaps an older, more comorbid man. Uh, active surveillance is frequent monitoring, and then if there's some trigger, then it's early radical curative treatment, whereas uh, watchful waiting is perhaps no uh, monitoring and then it's delayed palliative treatment uh, uh, in that case of watchful waiting. I want to show this, and again, we've, we've already covered it, but, but I think it's important and we can, we can concentrate over here. This is, again, only low-risk men, so these are those low CAPR score turtles. And when one looks at this over the years, I mean, things have changed a little bit, but primarily surgical approaches, the orange is radiation, and if we, and if we really look at the watchful waiting, it's less than 10 percent, perhaps maybe 15 percent now but still incredibly low, even in the ones in the PIVOT trial that didn't benefit when you randomize in between watchful waiting, in that case, and, and prostatectomy. So who are the patients we do this on? This is the classic low risk. These are the criteria. If one looks at the NCCN guidelines, this is what it comes out. Low stage, low PSA, low gleason. If one looks at very low risk, this is the Epstein criteria. It adds in a density calculation. It adds in some issues with how many biopsies uh, uh, need to be or can't be involved uh, with, with cancer. And these are the general classifications. I mean, we've done it differently in the canary cohort, which I'll show, but how have others uh, really uh, stratified it? Now, this is a very busy slide, and, uh, but the intent is, is to show you some of the reported series, and we don't have our series on here yet, but when you look at what is the entry criteria, and one can kind of focus on the middle three, which are in bold, because those are the largest and most mature series, the Hopkins series, the UCSF series, and the Toronto series. And one looks at uh, the, the take home that I get here is that they're variable entry criteria. So most uh, um, uh, say PSA less than 10, although maybe up to 15, uh, T1C at the Hopkins, uh, but the UCSF allows a palpable uh, a T2A lesion and again, on Gleason grading, there are sometimes some biopsy requirements, but not always. Very variable entry criteria here. What about monitoring? How do they monitor? Now, there's also very variable monitoring. It's very difficult to compare these series, at least 
uh, uh, directly to each other. Ruth Etzioni at our institution is turning in a grant to do some modeling work to try to figure out the intensity of surveillance, and uh, this will also be addressed uh, later in the talk. But if you look at the middle three again, Hopkins, a PSA every six months, UCSF every three, Toronto a little bit different. Biopsy, if we look at intensity of biopsy, Hopkins clearly is yearly biopsy. You know, they've really stuck to yearly biopsies. A year goes by real quick, I know, because we have many patients. But they've stuck to it. One looks at their measures. They don't have many missed biopsies. The UCSF has a much more variable schedule. And then I think this is a, uh, the, the schedule that Toronto has been doing for many, many years. And it plays in, let's keep this in mind, it's only every three to four years. So they have, uh, after a while, they're really spreading their biopsies out quite substantially, uh, which might play into some of the, the other results that they've had. And, that, and, and in the Canary, I'll show you what we've been doing in ours. So what are the triggers, uh, and what are the classic triggers for progression on active surveillance? And this lists the classic three. Either something in the biopsy happens, an increase in grade or volume, uh, or the PSA goes up and there might be a doubling time calculation, or something about the digital rectal examination. I think that's probably the, probably the most inaccurate and vague. Look at the, bio, the, the progression definitions again, kind of focusing on the middle three again. It's all over uh, the map when one looks at PSA uh, doubling time or velocity. Hopkins does not even say have any PSA definition, and we'll show I'll show you why that is. When we look at Gleason, most agree that any pattern four uh, is some sort uh, of a progression. Although the Toronto series let in three plus fours, so it has to really be a four plus three for a progression. And then some have no biopsy criteria, although Hopkins is very strict about uh, a volume criteria uh, to, to 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 theirs. Now there's been some issues. And, and we'll run through these one by one with regards to the progression definitions. Uh, there's PSA problems. And, you know, in other words, there's multiple studies showing that PSA doesn't matter. And that's what Hopkins abandoned it. Um, there's been this increase in grade. And there's, we know that the power of the microscope. My dad's a pathologist. So I joke with him all the time that, that, uh, you know, I gotta make up his mind about the grading system. And we've tackled this within the Canary Group. And I'll show you a little bit uh, of those data. And then there's this, this volume issue. So what about pathology? Uh, we know there's inter-observer variability. This was uh, a paper from our group, uh, from the Canary group, where we, we, we had GU pathologists from seven institutions, and we gave them 100 consecutive biopsies from our cohort, graded, uh, blinded, sent everything in. We found out that actually the inter-observer variability was quite good uh, uh, with a, with a uh, reproducibility for the classic lesion patterns. <laughs> That would be 0.76. But when one looks at these small tangential cuts on active surveillance, tiny biopsies, it was terrible. We had some pathologists saying it was at least an eight, others saying it was a six. Uh, it was all over the map. And how often does that happen? It happens in one in four patients that undergoes an active surveillance biopsy has this issue. So we know that the pathologists need to do a better job at getting together a consensus opinion. And Jesse McKinney who uh, uh, wrote primary off of this, who's now went from Stanford to Cleveland Clinic, is really tackling this on a, on a higher level. And we'll have central pathology for our study, which is which we think is, is vital to the validity of the endpoint. So the pathology has some issues. What about volume issues? I think this is uh, also has uh, important implications. Some mentioned absolute number of cores. Some are involved in percentage of cores. And then there's this whole, which is variable reporting, this is the, this I think is the big, big problem, is that how many biopsies one takes makes a difference. We have one of our sites in the Canary Protocol that not only does a 12 core sampling, but also if there's any lesion, takes a lesion directed, takes an anterior, does some transition zones, and variable depending on the size of the prostate. That might make sense, although it impairs the comparability between, between sites. And then there are others that are doing saturation biopsies. And what does it really mean can't do a saturation biopsy and find very small volume cancers. And the last is this issue of what is what is low tumor volume? We possibly think less than 0.5, although when they looked at the uh, European trial, that really might be pushed up more to, to the 1, 1 1.3 range. So what about PSA progression? And I'll get into this in our series in Canary, but this is why the Hopkins stopped using PSA doubling time. Because when they looked at the doubling time of the patients who progressed versus didn't progress, the doubling times was basically the same. Uh, I mean, there was a wide variability, of course, but it was basically the same. And they've noticed that whether it's a fast doubling time or whether it's slow did not relate to what they found in the prostate if they took the prostate out. So most groups, including the Canary group, 
have started to issue this uh, PSA progression issue, although others, uh, I think the Toronto group, you'll see, have been still hanging on this idea of PSA doubling time being a reflection of disease burden. And I'll show you that in a minute. So how about progression rates? Again, very busy slide, but I think what's important is, in general, when one looks at the big three, uh, in general, over a five-year span or so, there's about a 30% progression, the 30% treatment rate. And what there are some seemingly predictors that IPSA density is, is initial PSA density. Um, but when one looks over here, I think this is very important. If you look at the Hopkins series, uh, about a third went on to treatment because of a grade issue. About a third for volume, and almost a third had no progression. So there were many patients that were treated, ostensibly no progression. Similar in the UCSF cohort, about a third uh, went on to treatment with no clear progression. But when this contrasts to uh, the, the Toronto group, when looked at here, that their PSA was the major driver. So PSA was the major driver, and I think part of that, and I talked to Lori, in fact, it was just last weekend in New Orleans, I talked to Lori about why this might be, and he firmly thinks that the biopsies aren't occurring as much, three, three to four years, PSA is going up, and that's what's really prompting uh, a treatment rather than rather than a biopsy. Now, this, this begs the question, this burning question, is treatment after active surveillance equal to immediate treatment? And when I looked at, at, at here, this is active surveillance um, followed by prostatectomy on the top here. Sorry about that. On the top, about 70 patients and matched uh, 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 two to one with, with glottic prostatectomy immediately. And when one looks at down here at the Gleason grades and so forth, it appears basically the same. Uh, pathologic T stage might be a, it's trending towards worse disease after waiting for a while. These men waited on average about 19 months, a year and a half after diagnosis to going under treatment. I think this is controversial because when you look at the two big series that have really reported this uh, on, a, on a higher level, one looked at the Hopkins series, uh, almost 200 patients who were treated in their series, about half and half radiation and surgery. When we looked at the, the pathology, you see that, and there's only a 10% 10, 10 recurrence rate. This contrasts quite a bit, and I think Dr. Klaus and the Toronto group had, had a lot of um, answers to, to give with regards to theirs, and they had 125 patients. Most of them were treated with radiation, and there was a 50% failure rate uh, in, in the series. A part of this was due to, uh, they let in some gleason sevens. It was much different from the Hopkins series, but this is a uh, uh, cause for cause some concern initially. And then many of the patients who recurred uh, were treated later because they uh, did not follow their active surveillance protocol uh, uh, strictly. This is the last slide as far as the, the worldwide results because I want to get to our study. Is, is one looks at this again, these are all the studies, and really when you concentrate over here, you look at cancer specific survival. There, cancer, and the, the middle column there, very few people have died. I mean, the worldwide experience of a few thousand, 3,400, 3, almost 3,500 patients, there have been three or four deaths in the full cohort. So this is what's the, the current state. Uh, and this is the theoretical 100 men that have been, that are diagnosed, at least in the U.S., new, newly diagnosed prostate cancer. About half of them, the red ones are the classic active surveillance patients. The blue ones, at least 15%, maybe most of that top line, they're pretty clearly high-risk disease, gleason 8 disease, gleason 9 disease, um, and, and they're not an, a, your classic uh, surveillance candidate. If we follow them, there would be about a third of the red ones that, that turn into uh, um, operative, perhaps, or treatment candidates based on uh, progression. Uh, but what's happening right now, no doubt, in the United States what's happening right now is at least 90% are getting treated. Um, and you can see there that probably over-treated a large proportion of, of these men. So what's, what's uh, the last few things? What are the factors that offer uh, uh, the acceptance of this? Again, I, I think up here, there's there's much more acceptance than active surveillance. And where I am, patients uh, and otherwise social issues drive a lot of treatment, drive a lot of treatment choice. Um, and then here, the last thing we'll get in the research, so I, I had this, this uh, theoretical cartoon, this, this man coming to see me and he says, you know, I'm here for robotic prostatectomy. And I say, well, you're a perfect candidate for active surveillance. And he says, no, I'm here for robotic prostatectomy. You know, I mean, this is I, I was like I'm speaking to a wall. I said, no, well, you have very low risk disease. And then he says, uh, how can I be sure we need, uh, and this is where I'm getting to, biomarkers, please take out my prostate. <laughs> and I say, oh, we have a very protocol that's safe for you. And he says, 
My wife says my prostate belongs in the trash, <laughs> okay? Because spouses drive, uh, and we have to understand this and on a very serious level, how the familial psychosocial anxiety issues play, in, play into this. And I said, no, the, the protocol is called Canary Pass. It says, no, I'm going to Vancouver to see Dr. Gleason. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I, both Dr. Gleave and Dr. Goldenberg are high approved to the study, so I know that that access to health is wholly, wholly embraced here uh, at UBC. But there are, again, many factors that are in play. Um, and, I, and I added a, a couple of parentheticals for, for the talk here uh, in, in your country. But clearly, we, we as physicians fear of losing that window of curability many of my colleagues. Um, there's lack of long-term data. I show those study designs are only consistent. Um, there's this, this legal issue, and I, I had to put there in the United States because I know that's not as prevalent here. And then there can be some of these potential incentives uh, that favor treatment over active surveillance, and I probably should put in, in the U.S. there too because I know that that's, that's significant in some of the, the, the regions that I deal with. The patient... How about fear of losing the RPU? Yeah, that's, well, that's incentives. And the sense is favoring treatment. So, and I'll get into that in another slide because there is this issue of feeding the RVU or that's, that's, that's our work unit. Um, patients have very similar, the first line is the same as physician. They, they fear, fear of losing this window. Um, and then there are uh, various other issues that are listed here. And I, again, this, this decision making support, decision making, I'm not into that field, but uh, the issues of decision making are very, very important. Uh, particularly in active surveillance and how we can deal with that with the patient and, and particularly their family and partner and spouse. Well, here's the cost one. So there have been many uh, papers uh, uh, on cost and, and some of them are just coming out now. And one looks at cost and this is uh, a cost on the, on the y-axis over years and the, the red is active surveillance and you see a steady rise and each of those is biopsies. Biopsy, 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 or PSAs. And then you can see these various other curves uh, the, the biggest one, the green curve there being uh, uh, radiation, and I was joking last night at dinner that the, uh, the Seattle opened the Proton Bean Center uh, about a month ago, and uh, that curve would be like off this graph. It would be up there on the top because it's, uh, it's over $80,000 usually for, for a single treatment, and that would be encumbered on the initial diagnosis. So active surveillance costs. Uh, but over time, and it might be up there at the 10-year mark where it start might be might be catching up to surgery. And by then, you know, I've 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 heard a lot of people when I present this, they say, well, it's not really fair because if if someone gets treatment here, then all of a sudden you have to add one of the treatments on top of that. None of that is true. But you spare them some of the side effects. Uh, there are a lot of issues there uh, uh, that that are at play. So the costs are are highly dependent on the frequency of biopsy and the the duration, of course. And the, the cost of the primary treatments, uh, they, they include all the costs, and urology reimbursement is substantial. You know, obviously, there are people out there thinking, oh, I can do a bike every year and have this continual uh, issue of reimbursement. And most analyses don't include those treatment related side effects and complications. The cost is very complicated. Again, that's not what I deal with. I'm, I'm more in the world of biomarkers. Uh, but the NCI clearly said these are the things we need to do. And now we're going to go into how we as a group are addressing them. So improve pathologic molecular uh, uh, predictive markers, understand this issue of, of socioeconomic status and who is the right candidate for active surveillance or what I'm going to be calling inactive surveillance because I think we can have some patients that we inactively follow uh, and not need to biopsy every year. Decision making, which we mentioned, lifestyle, and then the last one, which is really what we've sought to do is create these registry-based cohort studies uh, and, and trying to build a machine on which to base our future research. And this is the Canary Protocol. Um, and you see uh, that, that uh, um, Dr. Gleave is the, the PI, the site PI uh, for UBC. And uh, this started out as five sites just on the, on the west coast with, with uh, San Antonio uh, joining in at, on the initial uh, run. And then we've, we've expanded uh, to other sites through the EDRN. This has been in existence for about five years. Uh, I won't show accrual by site data uh, because it's an, it's an evolving thing, but we have uh, very major accruals. The biggest ones really, again, on the West Coast because we started first. But now it's almost 900 patients. And um, uh, this is basically how it works. 
a man is diagnosed with prostate cancer if he chooses active surveillance. So it's not a randomized, not a, not a coercive uh, study to try to get the active surveillance. If they choose active surveillance, they're entered in the study. And again, we're all about biomarkers. We collect tissue, serum, plasma, DNA uh, on a regular basis, and I'll show you the schedule for that. Clearly, if they have PSA progression or histologic or clinical, now PSA has gone away, they're recommended for primary treatment. And I should put a, an arrow there that many men offered primary treatment still want to continue active surveillance uh, and, and not get primary treatment. I'll show you those data. Our goals are very basic. Start a multi-site trial, study the natural history, study the disease, assemble a high-quality biosystem repository and test the biomarkers. Here's the eligibility. and not reading the whole list, but you don't see here a grade requirement. So we let anybody in. And I think it's important, and I'll show you who actually gets in, but we wanted to capture the breadth of active surveillance. To a certain extent for biomarker research, because this broad, this broad criteria was very beneficial to some of our studies. And then we can also parse this cohort. We can say, let's just take out the, let's take out just the gleason sixes and look at them, get rid of the gleason sevens and see how they do. And I think this is offered a very powerful a design. We just let anybody in that shows active surveillance because men with gleason 7 disease still do. This is our, our design. They have PSAs every three months, but they only see us twice a year. So we see them every six months, but they have a PSA intern at a three-month level. We biopsy them rather early in that first six to 12 months just to make sure we're not missing something. We biopsy them at the two-year mark. So in the first two years after diagnosis, they have three biopsies. A diagnostic one, one about six to 12 months, and then one at two years. If they're very stable, at that point, they go to every other year. And we thought, think this is pretty fair, uh, although every other year goes pretty fast, too. I mean, I, I know that we have patients, you have patients here that two years goes quick, and they say, oh, my gosh, I have a biopsy I already do. We get research specimens at, at very frequent levels, blood and urine every six months, tissue at every biopsy, DNA at seven entry, and we enter it all into, into, a, into a repository. This is just to give you an example. This is a baseline, fluffy coat. Um, it's very, it's very uh, high level, and, and we have site. Uh, I have a site coordinator who goes to all the sites and makes sure that it's very rigorously correct, collected, and annotated. This all gets fed in here. The nine sites. It all the, the data gets fed into our, our data management center and coordinating center, and that's at the Fred Hutch. And then um, we have a central bioassessment repository also at the Fred Hutch. If we have uh, assays and collaborations, they get farmed out. All the data gets sent back. It's a nice, nimble operation, and it has. Uh, uh, things set in place that these studies can be done uh, very quickly. This just gives you a little bit of an idea of what we have involved. We have obviously very high-level committees for biomarker review, executive publications. We meet every we meet uh, twice a year, usually in Seattle or in Stanford, where our benefactor lives. And um, I, as I said, high-level oversight for data management. There's a central repository, and there's MTA collaboration agreements that are very very well uh, well in place. So this is uh, some of the, the demographics of our of our um, of cohort. This is 831 patients as of January. It's almost 900 now. It will be 1,000 hopefully by the end of the third quarter of this year. And this kind of gets into what I said before. It, 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 we let anybody in with active surveillance, but if you look at, at the simple criteria of Gleason score, you know, 92% are Gleason 6. So there are, been, there are some Gleason 7s in there. And again, this has allowed us to do some preliminary biomarker work on the front end. Most have a PSA by, by far, the majority under 10. And then if you look at the volumes of cancer, you see there that only 3% have more than 33% of the cores involved with cancer. So low volume, low risk, low gleason. Clearly, these are the active screener candidates. I'm going to cut right. Again, we can talk a lot about the, the characteristics, but I'm going to go right to the progression uh, and where we are. Again, this is, uh, this is January. We've had 109, out of 831 patients, we've had 191 progression events. Um, and they're divided there in, a, in kind of a complex table. But if you look at that 191 uh, um, progression events, the majority by far involve grade in some way. So grade here, 54% uh, plus grade here and clinical, grade and volume, and all three. When we look at most of the progression events in our series are due to grade. Perhaps because we biopsy more than the Toronto group but it's great is clearly driving uh, progression here. Now, does everybody have great progression get treated? Uh, clearly not. When we look at how many have been treated, remember we have 191 progression events, only 136 have received treatment. Some are evolving still. 
but many men that this says many men that actually have progression don't get treated. And then when I looked at here, out of the out of the whole 136 that were treated, 43 of them were treated with no clear study to find progression. And why is that? I'll, I'll I'll pause here and tell you. I think most of that is because they have a volume progression that's not quite enough to fulfill our definition. So a man comes in with one core, a tiny little microscopic focus of gleason six in one out of 12 cores. The next time he has two or three cores, which are, are still not fulfilling our definition of volume progression, yet he gets nervous or his family or something, and then they have treatment. So you see that at least a third of our patients are being treated. The other patients that are treated, at least a third are being treated uh, with no clear evidence of progression. If you look at the treatment times for overwhelmingly surgery, um, we have 90 patients that have received surgery. Uh, I, I deleted this morning the slide of the pathologic results because I think they're still in progress. I'd rather not show that now. I will say that we've had, out of the 93 that have had surgery, we have one node positive. Our margin rate is around the 10% rate. Our T3 rate is somewhere in the 15% rate. So is that similar to a diagnosis initial treatment? We'll compare that later, but I'll show that hopefully in future years, of course. But 93 patients have surgery, one node positive, about 15% T3, and it's about a 3 or 4% similar vessel invasion. So to end, we've done some ancillary studies, and I'll just present, we have many studies in play. I'll present three of them very quickly. We've looked at urine markers. These urine markers correlate with baseline disease characteristics. A very easy first play. And next, we're going to look at progression, of course. PSA kinetics. Can we, do we have to do these PSA so frequently? Probably not. And then the last is correlating uh, PSA velocity. I think it's actually very interesting. So this has just been uh, accepted and is in pressing clinical cancer research. I won't show all the data because it's, it's a fair amount. This is on the first approximately 400 patients. And we looked at uh, a T2 score, a T2 ERG score, it's a fusion protein, and PCA3. Does that, does that correspond to Gleason score at entry? It does. Does it correspond to tumor volume? It does. There's a big modeling uh, process that we model everything under the sun, and it still ha had a, has a play. This is basically proof of principle that perhaps PCA3 can be used to detect a higher grade disease, and we're going through this right now. This is the first 400 patients. We have the first 780 patients, uh, and that data is on my desk uh, back in Seattle to, to look at later this week. What about, what about uh, uh, the intensity of surveillance? Do we need to get PSAs every three months? Uh, or can we just get them every six months? Because because patients have this this uh, this fear of their PSA and they get very nervous right around their PSA. <coughs> this is just a, a, a simple plot plotting PSA doubling time based on every three months versus every six months. And when one looks here, clearly the green the green ones are the the corresponding. There are a few outliers that seemingly didn't progress if they were on a on a six month schedule, but but they they uh, did progress if they were on a three month schedule. So there are a few outliers. But when one really looks at the concordance, you can see yourself. It's very highly correlative. Another way of looking at it here, uh, the, the shading there is exact agreement, and, and the light there is not. You can see underpowered, certainly, at, uh, uh, to a certain extent for the progressors, but clearly there's some overlap here that we perhaps don't have to do surveillance uh, so actively uh, with regards to PSA. So what about PSA kinetics? Do we see the same thing as the Hopkins group does with uh, how PSA relates to progression? This is uh, um, men that are not progressed uh, on this side over here and, and men that are progressed over here uh, uh, by our definitions. And when one looks at the means uh, from across the room, you can tell it doesn't look that different uh, between the two. And we have actually seen this and said perhaps we uh, I don't need to do PSA. The one observation that we did make is that if you really look at those that have negative PSA doubling, so these are negative uh, PSA velocity, negative negative velocity, you see that very few men progress with a negative velocity. And why, why is their PSA decreasing? We might talk about that later. But when I, I looked at this, and then I looked back at the Hopkins, now this is doubling time, and I said, do they see the same thing? And I talked to Bal Carter about this uh, also uh, um, last week in, in New Orleans. And I said, draw a line at zero. And certainly the negative, there are a lot of negative doubling times he has. And none, and, but in the progression group, very, very few are progressing so-called progressing with the negative doubling time. So perhaps we can say something about this, and we have in our group, and we've really looked at biomarkers in a little different way, setting thresholds of sensitivity and specificity, again, a very busy slide, 
and don't have to work through the whole thing. But we can set a set level of sensitivity that we uh, preset, and we can say what is the negative predictive value, or at a set specificity, what's the positive predictive value. So if someone has a negative slope or a negative PSA velocity at that 0 0.2 range, you can say with 93% negative predictive value at three years, it will not progress. And similarly, you can set a threshold for increase. And and I think the world of biomarkers is not about making an AUC curve better. It's about uh, understanding thresholds, negative and positive predictive value, not just saying, oh, my AUC, my area under the curve is slightly better with this biomarker. I think that's short-sighted. So if many, uh, I'm ending here uh, ongoing work, uh, obviously longitudinal neuron markers, uh, looking at how they correlate to progression. We're modeling this intensity of surveillance. Uh, Ian Thompson is spearheading a, a project with our group looking at the need for surveillance biopsy based on, first of all, just clinical factors, and then we'll get into molecular markers. You know, there's this testing of these established platforms. We had collaborations with several industry partners, uh, GenProbe, at the time GenProbe, now called Whole Logic, uh, Genomic Health, Myriad, and others, um, to look at a variety of different biomarkers. And this with some of them, uh, my group and our group is, are interested in risk polymorphisms in the DNA. But you can read them to read through the whole thing, but you know, blood, blood markers, as well as uh, tissue-based markers, and then and so far, and I have really not touched on imaging at all, and the imaging really uh, is take, taking off. Not our whole entire group is involved in the imaging efforts, but I think imaging, it will be uh, the future in active surveillance. So these are the provocative questions that, that we all ask. Um, and I know that SWOG is asking the first two, which is how intensive do we need to, to be? Are there prevention strategies? Yesterday, the residents and I discussed many prevention strategies in general, but there's just diet and lifestyle, maybe 5-ARI, targeted area agents. And SWOG is convening uh, right for the AUA, and we'll be discussing that, and, and Dr. Gleave is leading that effort uh, in, the, in that area. The role of imaging, quality of life, and, of course, decision-making, these are vital questions in active surveillance. I have one slide on imaging because, it, because again, I want to give, give credence to the fact that imaging is very important. This is from the, the Memorial Group, where they did MRI and MR spec that gives a score. It's a very complicated method, but the bottom line is one can put in clinical factors plus a simple MRI score and then come up with a prediction of whether the patient actually has insignificant less than 0.5 cc cancer. Interestingly, in their series of radical prostatectomies, 40% were insignificant. So you wonder about overtreatment uh, right away. So I want to end with what with the impact of these biomarkers and what it really means. I showed this before. And how will biomarkers affect this? Clearly, there are some of those blue guys that are low risk, less than seven, three plus four, uh, that will remain indolent with time. And if we have a biomarker that can impact that, then clearly we will change many of some of the blues uh, to red. We will say only treat the blues and the, the black stick figures with primary treatment and how that will change the face of prostate cancer. Now we will hopefully treat 50 to 60 percent rather than that 90 percent. And that's sort of the future that we hope uh, will, will be in, in biomarkers. We think that we know it's indolent forever. Don't worry, be happy. Uh, if uh, it's an indolent but could progress, we watch that patient very closely. Active surveillance, if it's a steady state, we keep watching. Obviously, if it's potentially lethal, we treat, we treat radically, we treat for cure. And the goal is to find markers that will predict this change of state and, and move us on to the next, the next level. So I say this thing, you know, it's fine to discover cures, but remember, chronic conditions are our bread and butter. Uh, that's not a surgeon's, not really a, a natural surgical thing to say, but we want to turn some of prostate cancer into a chronic disease that we don't have to treat. The NCCN has been involved. They basically say low-risk patients get active surveillance. And I think this is very interesting. This is the European guidelines. You see them. It says men with low-risk prostate cancer who are considered suitable for radical treatment should first be offered active surveillance. It even says uh, active surveillance should be discussed as an option who have intermediate risk. So they're really pushing the bar. The NHS says first option is active surveillance, uh, not radical treatment. I'm ending with uh, Paul Schellhammer, and, and he gave a very poignant talk. As you know, Paul has prostate cancer. He's very open about it. And he said that active surveillance, the paradigm, perhaps not in his case, but in, in, in many cases, in immediate treatment is this war analogy. 
to cure the prostate cancer, you're at war with it, you want to survive from the prostate cancer. And after surveillance, it's quite a different paradigm. It's care for the cancer, be at peace with your prostate cancer, be a participant uh, as opposed to a survivor because it probably doesn't need to be treated. Uh, and, and he actually gave a very, very poignant talk about that. On a take-home level, again, you can read this yourself. We know how to identify low risk disease. We know we over-treat it. We, uh, I, the randomized trial supports surveillance, the PIVOT trial, and it appears safe. It's recommended by major organizations. We're not accepting it. We have to figure out a better way to accept active surveillance. And then, of course, the critical need are these new biomarkers and collaborative efforts. So I want to thank you. This is our past team. Again, this is just a partial list, but when one looked at the players that are involved, it's important to understand that at least I'm presenting the data, but it's really a gargantuan effort, in particular some support from the Kennedy Foundation, the EDRN, and then some of our industry partners. Uh, thanks, and happy to take questions.